Well, good morning. Good morning. You can be seated. Boy, y'all are awake today. That's awesome. I, I know y'all are really curious after the walk on what in the world is going on with the power strip. So, Tim, I'm going to keep you in suspense. Get there in a minute. Uh, but good morning. We are super glad you are here with us, whether you're joining us in-house or you're watching us online. We say welcome. We are glad uh, that you are here. We're really excited. Uh, but, you know, uh, one thing that we did forget to mention, and this is my back because I should have had like slides and fireworks and the whole thing for it. Uh, I do want to throw out a reminder that we will not be having services this coming Wednesday uh, because I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited to go see fireworks blow up. It's always one of my favorite things. I love fireworks. I probably loved them a little too much. Uh, whenever we were, Michelle and I were driving through uh, town uh, two or three days ago, she goes, man, there are so many tents here that sell fireworks. I'm like, this is actually a lot less than whenever I was a kid. I mean, like, they were just popped up everywhere on the side of the road, whatever have you. You didn't need a parking lot for a fireworks tent. You just threw one up in the ditch and uh, you could start selling fireworks out of that. So you ain't seen nothing. Of course, coming from the Atlanta area where like fun is not allowed, she's not used to all of this. And so she's like, do people really get all this? And then like that night, our neighbors all started going nuts with the fireworks. And it was just like, well, there's your answer, dear. And she's like, I just can't believe I mean people do this. I'm like, there's tons of money in it. I mean, they'll, like, you go buy a little thing, they're going to give you an gro entire gross of bottle rockets. And you can have some fun with bottle rockets. She didn't believe that. I was like, you, want even, you don't even want to know what I used to do as a kid. Me and my friends, we'd be running around out in mom and dad's field having bottle rocket wars. It's the, the, the trick is the timing. The trick is the timing. You know, you got to light it, then you got to watch it. Because you don't want to throw it and then have it hit the ground and then go off, because then you just wasted a bottle rocket. But you don't want to go off in your hand either. So just before the fuse runs out, you got to throw it at your deacon <laughs> and hope you hit it. She's like, y'all did not do that. I'm like, I've still got scars. Yes, we really did that. So uh, we will not be having surfaces because I want her to experience McMinnville's fireworks show. Can't drop the Nashville, y'all. But uh, I am really, really excited about it. And Tim, I, I know it's driving you nuts. You've got to know what's going on with the power strip. Well, see, what it is is I solved the Earth's energy crisis. Unlimited power now, baby. It's unlimited. It's just cyclical, right? I uh, tell you, it's been an interesting week for power. Uh, Tim's computers are blowing up. Leanne's Internet's blowing up. Uh, our dog is losing his mind. It, poor guy. Every time it thunders, it literally scares the poo out of him. Yeah. Literally, like, you know, boom. <laughs> oh, no, not again. We just went outside. Uh, so it's been, been an interesting time. But, you know, power is a funny thing. We're going to be talking more about power. Uh, and so, believe it or not, that did have something to do with the sermon. Because we are talking about power today. Uh, and, you know, power is one of those things that we kind of, take it for granted, don't we? Like we? We get here, you know, in the morning, we turn on all the light switches, we get the air conditioning going, you know, as hot as it is out there, we thank you, Lord, for air conditioning and for William Carrier or whatever his name was. But we take power for granted, and, and sometimes we just don't realize what we have access to. We don't realize what we have access to. I remember uh, my dad is one of these people that will tell the same story over and over and over. So when you're wondering where your preacher gets that habit, it's from it. I come by it honestly. Uh, but, you know, he, he will tell, a, tell you the story about uh, he can remember whenever he first got electricity at his parents' house. Like, he can remember life without electricity, which blows my mind. I don't know how a person functions without, you know, 72-degree air conditioning. I just... You know, i got to have it these days. But he remembers whenever they first ran electricity down, down the road and the utility company was going door to door and saying, hey, we're running these lines down your road. If you get on it now, if you'll let us run power to your house now and get you connected to the, to the network or the grid or whatever, now we won't charge you any of the connect fees or anything. We'll install it all, all that stuff because we want to get our hooks in you. And so my grandfather had the foresight to say, Sounds good. 
I'll take some electricity. So they were like, we'll do whatever you want to do. We're, you know, you want a light in every room, all that stuff? He said, just put a light socket in the dining room. That was literally it. That was all. And so for power, for iron and clothes, I think it was, he had them, we sell them at Walmart for like three bucks, little things you screw into the socket and it gives you two power outlets. That was it. The entire house had one thing of power. And so obviously they came to realize later, like, we're going to need some more. We're going to need some more. We're going to need some more. But my dad asked him one time, like, you know, why didn't you just go ahead and have them wire up the whole house? My grandfather said, well, son, I thought that was all the power I was ever going to need. I thought that was all the power that I was ever going to need. I think a lot of the times believers are operating in yesterday's power. We don't realize the power that is available to us. And so we still operate out of yesterday's power because we don't think, man, I'm going to need more power in the future. But God has unlimited power without cheap props. He has unlimited power. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on or open them up with me to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be continuing on with our, our study of, this, of the letter of, to the Ephesian church. I don't know why I put that in there. I don't need it. The iPad is working today. I don't need my sermon. But we're continuing on, and so Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to actually be studying a few more verses, but I want to start with these verses right here. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the length and the width, the height and the depth of God's love? And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that all of you may be filled with the fullness of God. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much for this time that we have to be able to come together to worship you, uh, to lift up your name in song and in praise and in prayer. And so, Father God, we pray, Lord, that you have prepared our hearts and that we have uh, allowed you to come in and make yourself welcome in this place, that uh, you wouldn't be able to move mightily. So, Father God, we surrender ourselves to you. We say whatever you want to speak into our lives, whatever you want to do, the answer is yes. Before we even know what it is you ask of us, the answer is yes. Yes, because we know, Father God, we are going to be drawing from a source of unlimited power when we draw from you. So, Father God, we thank you. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, i got to ask you, does anybody here struggle with any kind of confidence issues whatsoever? I do. i, I got to tell you. I mean, and, and if you don't, uh, you're doing far better than I am. I mean, we all have confidence issues in some area or another. I mean, for me, my... One of my greatest fears, I've told you before, is public speaking. I know, it's ironic. Here I am. But God has a sense of humor, and he has unlimited power, right? So my biggest thing is like, man, I, I feel sick to my stomach every time I know I have to get up here until I get up here, and then I'm fine. But I have a serious... Now, if I weren't preaching, if I had to get up here and tell you about widgets or underwater basket weaving, I would be terrified. But when I stand upon the Word of God, I draw power from the Word of God, then I know that I don't speak on my own behalf. And I am encouraged, I, I am fueled by that. And so, what if, what if there were just like some sort of miracle pill, some sort of magic pill, where like whatever issue you're struggling in confidence in, you could take that thing and you'd be radically transformed in that subject. You know, what if every time I felt nervous about getting up here and talking to you about underwater basket weaving, I could just take a pill and all of a sudden I'm like the Martin Luther King or the Billy Graham of underwater basket weaving. Right? How awesome would that be? You would take that pill, right? Or what if you're like, man, I am deathly afraid of heights. But you could take this pill and you'd be like, anybody want to go talk to the Empire State Building? 
I'm going to go learn how to fly a plane, y'all. I'm going to go parachuting and base jumping and all those other shenanigans. Because shenanigans is such a fun word to say that I just want to say it. Shenanigans. What if you could take that pill and that would happen? Me, I am terrified of spiders. Terrified. I remember one time I, uh, I got cold into the bathroom uh, at, a, at an old house. And there was a spider in the tub that was like, it was about that big, y'all. That's got to be that's got to be truth. It was like huge. I've never seen a spider this big in my life. And before I even knew it, I'm standing on the toilet going, "Kill it! Kill it! Kill it! Kill it!" I didn't even know what happened. But here I was. So what if you could take a you know a magic pill, and all of a sudden you're no longer afraid of spiders, but like you're Spider Man. That would be cool, right? I'd do whatever a spider can. What if? Well, as you could figure out, Tim, you got to stop it, man. You got to get together. You got to get together, man. I'm going to lose it up here. Obviously, we know that this pill doesn't exist. And, and, and we're being kind of hyperbolic and, and glib about it. But, you know, there are real issues that keep us from moving forward in our faith, aren't there? There are real fear issues that keep us moving forward in our faith. You know, uh, I, I don't want to be baptized because what might people think about me? Because I'm going to look kind of silly getting soaked in that horse trough, aren't I? Or, man, I feel like this godly person has been brought into my life, but, you know, I don't, I, I got so hurt by that last relationship. I don't know if I should trust this person. Or, you know, hey, I know God is calling me to start this ministry, but what if it fails? What if it fails? What if it fails? I, guys, I get that. Church plant in Athens failed. And so when it came time to come and plant this church, I was like, what if we fail again? There's some serious issues, right? I know, I'm just being kind of glib and silly about things, but there are real situations that keep us from moving forward in life. I mean, and, and maybe we see, like maybe we've just gone through that season of like, man, I had a dream. I had a dream. I had a serious dream, and I felt sure that it was a God-called dream, but you know what? It's failed. That dream has died. It's been taken from me. And I don't understand. And now I'm afraid to dream any further. I'm afraid to think about where am I going to go next. I'm afraid to think about what is God going to ask of me now. And the reason that we struggle with that is fear. It's because we don't understand the source of the power that is available to us. But it turns out Christ's love, it gives us whole access to a brand new realm of, of, of confidence, of power that we can draw upon, but we have to go to it. If I don't go turn on that air conditioner, well, Tim turns it on Saturday nights because he's a good deacon. But if we didn't come in and turn it on, we'd all be roasting in here, right? We have to draw access. We have to go to the access. We have to turn it on. we got to go where the power is. And a lot of times we don't do that. Because this Holy Spirit, it's, it's working uh, about within a change in our hearts. And, and it gives us, you know, if we really understand it, that we're going to really tap into this just unrelenting faith that whatever God says is going to happen, it's going to happen. I remember a few weeks ago, we got here, and it was right at the start of summer vacation. School has just got out. There was four of us here. The preacher, his wife, the deacon, his wife. Now, is that, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm not here to make you feel guilty about anything like that. Listen, you got lives, and I understand that. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying, in that moment, it would have been easy to look up here and say, you know what, like, we all, we, let's just go home and watch Charles Stanley, right? You know, let's just go home. But instead, I got up here, and I looked down, and I said, I see all of these chairs, and in my mind's eye, I see Every chair filled. I see us pulling out the folding chairs. I can see this coming because God has called us to it. And so I know that he is going to build his church. And so we draw power from that. But I have to choose to draw power in those discouraging moments. In those moments in your life where you think, I'm afraid to dream about whatever God is calling me towards. I am afraid to even think about praying for this person who has been so far from God for so long 
that. I just can't see them coming to know Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, what would happen if you were to decide to have unrelenting faith that, hey, if God changed your heart, I know he can change theirs. I just know it. And so maybe, maybe we, we just need to plug in to that greater source of power because we don't need a magic pill. We have faith in Christ. And that is all the confidence that we really truly need. It gives us more provision than anything humans have ever created could possibly offer. So let's go back to the scripture because you ain't got to take my word for it. Let's go back to the scripture. We're going to look at Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 is the, the entire passage that we're going to be reading. And he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every name in heaven and on earth is named. And let's hang on right there. Let's go back to that real quick because it's really important. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom? From whom? So from the Father, every family is named. Whether they're in heaven, whether the angels or whether the humans on earth, they are named by the Father. That's important. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. But let's move on. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with what? Power. Power. In your inner being through his spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love. i got to quit walking around. I can't even read my Bible. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in faith, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width, height, and depths of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power of there's that word again, power that is in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul's talking a lot about power, isn't he? He's addressed that quite a bit. So there must be something to it. But let's go back. You know, we, we, we had verses 14 and 15. I had you pause there for just a moment. Because he talks about being named by the Father, doesn't he? He says everything, every family, whether in heaven or on earth, is named. Now, here in a Western context, we would just kind of brush over that, wouldn't we? We all got names, but like Kevin... When I was given that name, mom had heard the name Kevin and liked it. And I'm really glad I wasn't a girl because it was going to be like Margaret Suzanne or something like that. It was just like weird. Anyways, thank you God for making me a fella. Anyways, Kevin has not got any kind of meaning to it. There's no reason to Kevin and, and most of us are named that way, right? Most of us are just named an arbitrary name. There's no serious meaning behind it, but you know, if you're a, if you're a first century Jew, a lot different context, a lot different thinking when it comes to being named. I mean, you remember all throughout the Old Testament, we kept hearing about like so and so was named this because it meant this, right? I mean, we got like Esau born like a red hairy Chewbacca baby, right? Can you imagine that? You know, here's Esau coming out. He's the first of the twins, and he looks up. He's covered in hair. He's like, mm, what the what? Esau it is. Because Esau means red, and it means hairy. Can you imagine that being your name? I mean, I've had some bad nicknames or for it to be your given name. Holy cannoli. Dad, you're just being mean. But then Jacob's being born right behind him, and he's holding on to the heel of Esau. And so Jacob means heel grabber or deceiver. And we learned that Jacob is a serious deceiver. And so names had a lot of meaning to a Jew. And so there's also another really important thing that we don't think about. But to a first century Jew and previous to that, if you named something, 
That meant you had authority over that thing. Remember God placed Adam in the garden and he said, you're going to have authority, you're going to be the keeper of all of creation. And then all the animals are brought to him and they na he names them all. He has given authority over creation. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. The Father has named you precious. He has named you his child. He has named you his creation. That means he has authority over you. This is saying there is nothing on heaven and earth that God the Father does not have authority over. God the Father has authority over every situation that is going on in your life. If it's good, give Him praise. If it's bad, give Him praise because He has authority over each and every situation. Let's get back because I am way off course. You know, if I, I'm, I'm kind of one of these people like, you ever hear a parent say, like, tell their kids, we're not going to name it, we're not going to name it, we're not going to name it when it comes to a stray animal? You know why, right? Because once you name it, it's yours. Well, I didn't take that lesson very well. At our old house, stray dogs would come up all the time. And if it came up more than once, I named it. I mean, keep it. I mean, but still, I named the thing. And we have one, just called him Stanley, because Stanley Cup is a ridiculous name. So we just called him Stanley. But, uh, you know, he came by so often. I think, uh, We were renting at the time. I thought, sorry, buddy, I can't keep you. But if I could, I would. And so whenever we were getting ready to move to the house that we had bought, I, thought, I told Michelle, I thought, if that dog, if Stanley still doesn't have a collar, he's coming with us. It's like, okay because I had named it, and so I was like, okay, I've named you, I have authority over you now. You're coming with me. Sadly, somebody else had already claimed Stanley before we closed on the house and moved on. But that's all right, we got Zeke now, we love our Zeke boy. Which is cool, because I probably would have started calling him Stanley Cup. But you know, that's just me. But again, names are a big deal. They, weren't, they were given to convey a meaning. And so when the Father has named you, he is saying, I have authority over you. Now Paul himself, he's written this, and they know this. Paul went from Saul to Paul, right? You've just learned about that, right? Pretty cool story, pretty crazy story. But it's a big, big deal. Because if you're given a name, that means that thing has authority over you. That thing can speak into your life. And so the situations that seem in control of you, that seem to be overwhelming you, are the situations that God himself has authority over. He has control over. And so we talk about the power that God has. He doesn't just have the authority over these things. That means he also has the power. Remember, Paul just wrote a lot about the power. So what is that power? Well, it's the same power that raised Christ from the grave. The very same power that raised Christ from the grave is the same power that is within us. Ephesians 1.18. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of your heart. He's saying, guys, that's, that's your imagination. So I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine being so filled with the confident hope that he has given to those he has called, his holy people. There he is. He has, he has authority over you. He has called you. He has named you his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's what? Power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So when that situation feels overwhelming, when you have seen that dream die, you've seen that passion lost, you thought for sure that you were being pulled in one direction, but that all of a sudden it's cut off to you and you're thinking, I don't know how I dare to dream again. 
I don't know how I dare to believe for anything further. Then we remember that everything under the sun is under the authority of God and we can draw upon the same power that is the power that raised Christ from the grave. So he's saying, I pray that your hearts are going to be so flooded with light. I, I, I pray that you cannot imagine anything else is what Paul is writing. Is that I cannot hope anything other than I would hope that you would understand just how much God loves you and how powerful God is. And so understand the confident hope. I love that. The confident hope, he says, that is given to you. We're his holy people. So he's wanting to, to understand the greatness of the power that is available to him. Or you think, well, that's all well and good. But that's Christ's power, right? I mean, that's God's power. But I, I, don't, I don't have access to that. I don't have access to, to that same kind of power. Well, Scripture disagrees, Acts 1.8. You will receive what? I'm not going to say it again. Somebody else tell me. Power. Power, thank you. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people all about me everywhere in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That means everywhere you go, you go with the power. You have the power that raised Christ from the dead. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit within you. It comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So you have access to that power, but that doesn't mean you're going to be Spider-Man. That means you have everything you need to draw from to be his witness, to tell people about him everywhere you go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. For first century Jews, they can't imagine anything beyond that. They don't hop on airplanes to fly to Guatemala. Going to the end of Samaria is enough of a journey for them. But he says, go even further. Go to the ends of the earth and you will go in my power. So that's what he's telling us. Is we're going to receive his power when we receive his Holy Spirit. And because of that, because of that, we, have, we can draw confidence. Because isn't that comforting to you? It's comforting to me that I do not have to create my own power. We can plug into the TVA and get power, right? Draw power from the river. We can draw power from the living water. That is Christ. Because he sent his comforter to rest upon us. And so whenever those situations seem dark, whenever those, maybe you're stepping into a, a new journey and that scares you. Maybe you've been disconnected on a journey. Maybe you've had that, uh, that dream die. And you just think, I... I I don't understand and I'm afraid to move forward. I'm afraid to imagine anything else. Then I love what he said. And let's go back to 17 and 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being what? Rooted and firmly established in love. Again, we're not going to enjoy the air conditioning if we don't come and plug into it and turn it on, right? We've got to plug into the love of God. That means resting in his word that means spending time in his word are you going to have any confidence in a stranger but I know my parents I know I, I trust them don't I because I've, I've spent time with them they're not strangers to me so it's easy for me to trust them I trust my wife because she's not a stranger to me Heather you, you trust him most of the time I, I probably don't as much but you know but it's because he's not a stranger to you, right? So it's easy to trust somebody you know. How are you going to know God if you won't get to know God? And that means spending time in this word, spending time in prayer. Because you can't just come in here and, and listen to Kevin yell for an hour and then go home and that's all you ever hear about God. Because you're not going to trust that stranger. We have to be firmly rooted being rooted and firmly established. Now, like, you know, we're trees, city, right? Trees all around this place. These trees are in the ground, ain't they? 
their roots are dug in. The further their roots are dug in, the greater they stand in the storms, right? So are you going to dig into the Word? That's the question. Are you going to dig in to your relationship with God? Because we are not created to be informed about God. We are created to be transformed by God. But that means we have to experience God. And so that's what he's saying here is, I want you, Paul's saying, I want you to experience a relationship with God. Not just read about it. I want you to experience Church of Ephesus, I'm going to re write you this letter. You're going to read it. You're going to pass it on to the next guy. I don't want you to just read this and be done with it. I want you to read this, be encouraged by it, and be rooted in your faith. I remember a couple of years ago, I went to a mission trip to Mexico, and I'd never been, I've been to Texas a couple of times, but outside of that, never been any further west than the Mississippi River. And so I was really excited about it. Really nervous about it, but I didn't really think anything about where I was going other than I was going to Mexico, right? Well, we flew into San Diego, drove down to Mexico, getting get ready to come home. We drive back up to San Diego so we can fly out. We get there the night before. So I go out to the Pacific Ocean. Now, I, I'd seen the ocean before, but I get there right at sunset. And I was completely in awe, just completely enamored with it what I was witnessing because it occurred to me I had seen a sunrise on the Atlantic but I'd never seen a sunset on the Pacific but this is the same source of light that passed over the entire nation we all experience the sun at some point don't we but we experience it at different times. I thought, man, there's just something beautiful about that. That knowing that this, I mean, it's steady, right? The sun's coming. You know it's going to come up back again in the morning. And so that's the power we draw from is we know it's constant. We know it's steady. We know it's not going away. And so we're all going to experience it. But if I go and dig a hole in the ground, I'm not going to experience the sun, am I? I have to choose to come out into the light. And so that means it has to be personal. I have to be personal. I have to make a choice to go experience Jesus. It's not going to just happen. But just like the sun, we all experience it at different times depending on where we are. It all comes down to timing, right? We all have to have the time in the Word. And being rooted, it says that it leads to the fullness of God. Can you imagine experiencing that in your day-to-day -day walk? Being filled with the fullness of God? How incredible would that be? And finally, just finally, we would have something worth sharing, wouldn't we? Because you can't share what you don't have. And nobody's going to be interested in sharing anything that's not worth building a legacy on. You cannot build a legacy without being filled with the fullness of God. So it has to be personal. And only then, only when we personally experience Jesus, can we have the confidence in his plans for us. Because then he won't be a stranger. So I know that we may be going through different things. I know some of us are, are, are going into a new journey. And that scares us. That can be a little bit frightening. It can be a little bit intimidating. You might, you know, you're probably thinking, I never planned on being on this path. I thought this path was unavailable to me. And so I'm trusting him in the unknown. And maybe you say, well, I've been trusting in a situation that I felt sure and confident was going to happen, but it's not happening. It's not happening the way I thought it was going to happen. And so now I don't dare to dream any further because this dream has died. And my, my, my suggestion to you is this. Maybe what you thought was going to happen, maybe that dream that you thought for certain was going to happen, God had to allow it to die so he could birth a new thing in you. 
Maybe he had to allow that dream to die so he could get you to the plan that he had for you. So sometimes that means stepping back and gaining a God perspective. That, but that means we have to allow our own perspectives to be put aside. So my question for you today as we close is, what is Jesus calling you to do? Where is he calling you to trust him? What new thing is he calling you towards? What old thing has had to die and you're having to trust him with going forward? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder if there's somebody here today who say, you know what, that's me. I, I need to plug into that power. I need to have the confidence I'm struggling with that confidence, but I need to know that I have the Holy Spirit within me. As a follower of Jesus, I have the Holy Spirit within me. And so I can draw upon power. I can draw with confidence that I will be filled with the fullness of God, that God is not done with me, that God has a plan for me, and that it's going to be a plan for a legacy. If that's you today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I just want to pray with you. Is that you today? You would say, God is calling me to a new thing and I, I'm having trouble with my confidence in him but I'm going to choose today to trust him is that you today anywhere in this house anywhere maybe you're watching online you would say you know what Kevin I, I, I feel like God is calling me to something something bigger than myself and that's scary for me but would you pray with me we absolutely will email us prayer at treecitychurchtn.com I promise you somebody will respond to you. But you know what? Uh, the truth is, none of us can draw upon this power until we have chosen, chosen to follow Jesus. Because this power is reserved for those that have been named by God as His children. Not just His creation, but His children. Personally known by God through Jesus. And so, my question to you today is, are you a follower of Jesus? Have you made a decision in your life where you would say, yes, whatever God calls me to, I believe God sent His Son to die for me. I believe that His Son died, was raised back to life for my sins. He bore my punishment. And because of that, I am able to return to God and experience a personal relationship with God. Have you made that decision before? And if you have not, my question to you is, what are you waiting for? Would this be the day, would this be the hour that you would choose to say yes to Jesus? Anyone in this house? Maybe you're watching online. You would say, I'm choosing today to follow Jesus because I want to tap into that power. I want to experience Jesus in a brand new way. Anyone? Father God, we love you. We thank you so much for this time that we've had together to be able to learn more about your love for us, the strength that you have given us, the power that we can draw upon. And so we pray, Father God, that this would not just be 30 minutes of being reminded, but it would uh, begin a, a life of being transformed by you, of being firmly rooted in you, and, and walking in a personal experience relationship with you so that we would not be choosing to trust the stranger, but we would be choosing to trust a known God. A God who is not dead, but who is alive and is actively working in our lives. Who has authority over every circumstance that is going on in my life. That everything is in His control and that we can choose to trust in You. So, Father God, we thank You. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. This altar is available to you. Tim and I would be happy to pray with you.